I just want to encourage us tonight from the Word of God for just a little while. I want to talk to you from the book of Second Peter, uh, the third chapter. Um, and, and I actually had uh, in my notes that I was going to read verses 9 through 18, but I think I'm going to uh, just kind of lay a little bit of a foundation a little bit. I'll start at uh, verse number 1, actually, and I'll kind of skip around a little bit. But it's Second Peter, the third chapter. And um, verse, I'll start at verse number one. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord is so recorded. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant. Of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved against reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men he says but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm almost there. Listen to this. Verse 10 says this. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversations and godliness? Let's skip down to verse number uh, 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, and they do also other scriptures as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction ye therefore beloved seeing that you know these things before beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your steadfastness amen let's uh go before the lord in prayer father we thank you tonight lord god we thank you for your word i pray tonight lord god that you would help me god to Encourage your people, Lord God. Speak through me, Lord God. Anoint these lips of clay, God, that they might minister, Lord God. Help us to understand your word, God. Help us to live your word and do your will. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I want to talk to you tonight about uh, the twisting of time. Uh, time is the most precious commodity on the planet Earth. Now, this is my opinion, but I also, even though it's my opinion, I think there's some fact to that. <laughs> and uh, the reason why I say that is because every other commodity uh, on the earth can be replaced. Amen? Uh, we're in a crisis now in our society where fuel and, and, and gas is a big problem. 
and gas prices are sky high and uh, people are looking for uh, the oil companies to drill more and it's a whole bunch of confusion going on. Everybody's pointing the blame at this one and that one. But at the end of the day, if we used all of the oil that we have, or currently have, if all of our reserves were exhausted, they would just drill for more. They would find somewhere to, to find uh, more. Um, and so, but time is not like that. Once time is gone, it's gone. Man, uh, you think about uh, the farmers and, and their crops, you know. Every year they get to plant a new harvest. Each year, you know, they, they make what they could from this harvest, and next year they plant a new harvest. But that time that's passed, you can't get that back. And so, uh, one of my, uh, one of the writers I used to listen to, uh, is a good preacher, Dr. Miles Monroe. He died some years ago, uh, ago in, a, in a plane crash. But he talked about time, and he said time was the great equalizer in the sense that at the start of the day, every one of us gets the same 24 hours. But it's how you use that 24-hour time frame that determines, you know, sometimes if you're going to be rich or poor. It, it determines if you're going to be on the top or if you're going to be on the bottom. And that's the difference, how people used their time, what they did with their time. Now, I, I, I grew up hearing that, uh, you know, you had 24-hour day, you had eight day to work. I mean, I'm sorry, eight hours to work. You had eight hours to serve God and man, and you had eight hours to rest. And that was, seemed pretty logical to me, you know. But I was kind of strolling on my phone the other day, and I came across this reel. And this, this guy was talking, and he said, he said, rich people don't have or they can't afford to sleep for eight hours a day. And I'm thinking to myself, maybe that's how they got rich. They, they divided their time to do what they wanted to do to get where they wanted to be. How do you spend your time? Uh, I, I heard some, some years ago, I heard Pastor Shepard talking about uh, Brother Scott. Uh, and he said that Brother Scott would play the saxophone. He, was, he would practice literally until his lips would bleed. Now, we hear him now, and we, we, we you know, especially if you're new to this church, you hear him up there wailing, and you think, man, that guy's awesome. But you weren't there when he, when his, when his, when he was practicing when his lip was bleeding. See, nobody, nobody, that's the part that nobody sees. That's the time that he invested when no one was looking to be able to play that way. Uh, I talked to Brother AJ, and Brother AJ told me, he said, when he was trying to learn how to play by ear, that he would put stuff his ears with, with earphones or something and, and muffle his ears so he couldn't hear, and he would just play, not listening to anything, trying to learn how to play by ear. And if you see Brother A.J. now, he, he's, I don't know whether he's playing the saxophone or the saxophone's playing him. <laughs> Amen? Because he's moving and grooving. I mean, he, it sounds good, but, but again, that's the time that he's put in. Uh, I talked to Brother Newton. Brother Newton told me a story of how uh, his little girl, little sister, little sister Stephanie, that's over here wailing on the drums. He said from a little girl, she would just start, she would just be beating on stuff. Now she's, she's playing the drums. They, they didn't just wake up one day and start doing it. it, it, it they may have, I, I take that back, they may have just woke up one day and decided they were going to beat a drum or, or blow a horn or whatever. But they didn't get good by just thinking about it. They had to invest time into doing it. And so where you put your time will determine, you know, what lot probably sometimes you, you have in life. Amen. What are you investing your time in? What are, you, what are you doing with your time? And oftentimes we look at, we, we're guilty, all of us are, are doing it, are, are guilty of doing it. We look at people sometimes and we, we, we uh, 
look at the success they have and we think, gee whiz, they're gifted, they're blessed. That might be true, but it's not just the gifting or the blessing that got them to that point. They had to invest into it. It is the same thing when it comes to our relationship and our soul. You've got to invest in your soul. Amen. You've got, you've got to take the time to take care of your spiritual being. And, and Peter is talking a little bit about here this, uh, in this text here, very, very ex exciting text. But, but before I get into that, here's the thing that, that really strikes me about this text. Peter is talking to the church, but he's reminding us that in the last days that scoffers are going to come. Amen. That people are going to look at you and what you, if you're investing time in the Lord, they're going to look at the time that you're investing in going to church and doing the things of God, and they're going to tell you, hey, you're wasting your time by going to church because nothing has changed through all these years. He said, this, the, the, they're going to tell you that the way things are the same way that they were way back in the day. Nothing has changed. So you're wasting your time by going to church, by doing these things that we consider valuable to investing in our soul. Scoffers are going to come to us and tell us that we are wasting our time. But then he says this. He says, this they are willfully ignorant of. And I like this portion. They are willfully ignorant of the fact that even way back when, it was the word of God that contained and controlled time. It was the word of God. He talked about the, 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 the earth that was out of the water and the, the earth that was in the water. He's talking about the pre-flood earth and the, the, the earth after the flood. And he mentioned the current earth that we lived on. Let's just read it, just in case you, you think I'm making this up. Verse 5 says this. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved against fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men it was the word of God that controlled things God spoke the word to Moses that the flood I'm, I'm sorry to, to Noah that the flood was coming it was the word of God and, and listen he hasn't changed what he has spoken is still going to come to pass. It may seem like a long ways off. It may seem like we've been waiting on it for a very long time, but we stand on the promises of God. As the scripture says later on, he is not slack concerning his promise. We can stand on the word of God and we can believe that God's word is true. And he talks about, in this text, he talks about the things of the earth. And he says not only the earth, but the things that are in the earth. They're going to pass away with the fervent heat, with the fervent heat and a loud noise. And I got to thinking, you know, when I was, uh, uh, I, I, I was in Bosnia sometime, some years ago, I think in the, in the 90s. And I remember driving we went through that country. We went through almost every inch of that country. And I'm telling you, you talk about war-torn, there was not one house, not one building, not one structure that was not destroyed or that was not impacted or hit by mortar or some type of bombing. Not one. In every city. I was looking at uh, some of the footage of uh, Ukraine and Russia right now. And how it just seems like they're just destroying all these beautiful buildings and all these things. And, you know, and it just, it seems like a, a just a waste. And no regards for life. No regards. And, and, and essentially, what Peter is saying is kind of sort of the same thing. 
there's really no value to these things. These things are transitory. I mean, of course, we give them value. We give them value. If we, we, we have, we, if I pulled up, we opened the doors here, and I, and I drove in here a brand new spanking Mercedes Benz, you wouldn't say that's valueless, would you? I wouldn't. Should, I, I'd like to have one. You know? <laughs> but, 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 but what's the real value of it? You can't take it with you. What's, what's the purpose of it? And, and I, you know, then you ask yourself the question. What is the difference in the Mercedes and the Pinto? Anybody know what a Pinto is? Huh? <laughs> Brother Willie, you know what a Pinto is? What, what's the difference in it? Is it the, I'm, I'm, I'm talking at the end of the day. What's the difference in them? They do the same thing. They get you from point A to point B. The Pinto actually might be a little cheaper on gas. But in our society, if we're being realistic, we have given that Mercedes a value. Mercedes, it didn't give itself that value. We gave it that value. We gave it that value. You take, for instance, uh, uh, My Michael Jordan. Now, when I was in high school, we wore the Michael Jordan tennis shoes, Air Jordans. Okay? You had on a pair of Jordans, you were a somebody. Now, here it is. A lot of years later, we need, don't, don't worry about the number. A lot of years later, the same shoe that, that they wore when I was in high school, my daughter is now wearing. But they cost almost three times as much for the same shoe. How does that happen? We gave Michael Jordan value. He's still the same guy. In fact, he's older. He's not playing basketball anymore. But somehow or another, the same shoe, the exact same shoe from 30 years ago has now tripled in price. Why? Because we gave it value based upon what we purchased, based upon what we deemed as valuable. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. And, and, and they, they, they've got gone crazy with it now. Like, my daughter, she, you just can't buy the shoes. You have to buy, I, I never heard such a thing, a crease guard. A crease guard. So you put it inside the shoe so that when you walk, the shoes won't crease. I'm thinking, what? So the next time you see a kid with a pair of Jordans on and he's walking like this, he's walking like this because he hadn't got his crease guards in yet and he don't want to crease his shoes. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. But that is the value that they have put on a pair of shoes. Now, Peter is telling us that there's coming a day here that none of this, where none of this stuff is going to matter. And he's saying that seeing that you know this, seeing that you as a children of God know that these things are going to pass away and that they're temporary and that they're transitory, what manner of life ought you to live? How much more should we represent, you know, the things of God? How much, how much more should we live as people of God? Because we cannot put our hope in these temporary things. People, Solomon talks about it. 
he talks about the man that, that, that builds wealth and then he dies. And he, the, he, he doesn't know if the wealth is going to, and I'm paraphrasing, he doesn't know if the wealth is going to end up going to a fool. You build all this wealth, but when it gets really down to it, what really matters is your relationship with God because those temporal things you cannot take with you. So we need to establish a foundation and a relationship with God, something that's going to last us, something that's not transitory, something that's not temporary, but something that is eternal. And what has happened is, over the, the way the world looked at it, according to Peter, they're looking at the time frame and God's long-suffering and his patience towards us, and they're scoffing at us. And Peter's saying, no, you don't understand. God's going to fulfill his word. He's not slack concerning his promise, but he is long-suffering towards us because he doesn't want us to die and go to hell. He just keeps giving us time. While, you're sitting, while they're sitting there pointing the finger at you saying, when is your God coming back? You've been talking about Jesus for a thousand years, two thousand years, and we haven't seen anything. Where is Jesus? And Peter's saying, listen, you're looking at it the wrong way. He doesn't want any of us to perish, so he's giving us time to repent and get ourselves together. Because the day is coming. The day is coming where he's going to crack the sky. And Ed, you know the story. It's going to happen just like the Bible says. But what the world has done and what they're doing is they are taking this period of time, this grace period that God has extended to us to repent of our sins and to serve him. And they're using that as evidence of God's inability to fulfill his word. They're saying it's been, essentially they're saying it's been too long. You, you've, been, you've, been, you've been praising God for all these years and, 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 and nothing has changed. It brings me to the scripture where, where, where he talks to Abraham. He says, after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. In other words, I'm going to praise him regardless if I get it or not. I may not. Listen, Abraham never saw it, not in the flesh. Abraham saw it in the spirit. You see, we are still Abraham's seed. We are still a part of the promise that God gave to Abraham. Even though Abraham himself never saw it in the flesh, we are Abraham's seed that was prophesied about way back in the beginning, fulfilling the word of God. We're the children of faith. You know the story. You know what God promised Abraham? That your seed was going to be like the sand on the seas? That's us. Hallelujah. We're just grains, grains of sands that God promised Abraham that was going to see the promised land. But saints of God, in order to get there, you've got to live this thing. You can't just get there, you know, on the flowery beds of ease. You can't live any kind of way and get there. You've got to be holy. And Peter was saying, listen, you know, as the people of God, you know the truth. And having the understanding of the truth, what manner of life ought you to live? What are you going to represent? Who are you going to represent? And then, here's something that really just, really, really, really excited me. Verse number 15 says this. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. The patience of God, this, this long time that you're complaining about, it's God giving you an opportunity. It's God giving you an opportunity to repent. It's God giving you an opportunity to say, listen, listen, I, I, I know it's been a long time, but there's still some folks out there that I'm waiting on to come on into the kingdom. 
So then the question becomes, what are you waiting on? He's waiting on you. He's holding the door open for you, waiting on you. But there's coming a day when that last Gentile is going to step in there and the door is going to close. Hallelujah. And he says, an account that the long suffering of an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Now, I, I like the fact that Peter is echoing the words of the apostle Paul. Because there are too many people who try to say, well, they preach different doctrines. Not so. The Bible says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So I, I love the fact that he's, he's channeling Paul here. And then he says, Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him has written unto you. As also in all the epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood. Now, that's a fact. I'll be the first to tell you. I don't know everything about the Bible. There's a whole lot of stuff that I, I'm learning. You know, I, and I, I listen to, to, you know, when, when uh, other ministers get up here, to, and especially pastors, when, when God gives them revelation about things, I say, whoa, that's amazing. That's a, and and, and, and you, you, just, you just are constantly reminded that there's more knowledge, that there's more wisdom. That, that there's more that God wants to give you. And there is a fact, Peter says it right here. There are some things that are just hard to understand. But I'm not going to waste my time, Brother Peter, you know, arguing over things that make, I'm not going to say it doesn't make sense, but it has nothing to do with my salvation. You see, I've got the basics down. You know, I might not know the, the, the you know, everything that's concerned eschatology and all the things of the Bible. I may not have all that, but I know one thing, that if I repent of my sins, that if I'm baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, and if I'm filled with his spirit, I believe I'm on my way to heaven. You see, I got the basics down. I'm not going to sit here and have a theological debate with somebody over a whole bunch of unnecessary topics. I'm not concerned about that. But I've got the basics down. I've got a relationship with God. I've been filled with his spirit. And listen, even though I might, un might not understand it now, his word declares unto me that his spirit will lead me into God and guide me into all truth. So I might not have the understanding today, but I believe with all my heart that if I would get on my knees and I just talk to him and I pray about it and I fast about it, that God will reveal it unto me. You know why? Because he wants to be known by you. He doesn't want to be a mystery in your life. He wants you to know him. He wants you to experience him. But you can only do it by drawing nigh unto him. Who glory. I want to be close to him. I want to be close to him. I want to feel his presence. I want to experience him. Oh, glory. And so now, let's go a little further here. Whew, I feel good. Is that all right? I'm excited about this lesson. And then he says this, verse 16. As also in his apostles speaking, in his epistles, speaking in them of these, of these things, and which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Now, God gave me some good revelation on this, on this scripture here today. He said that they who are unlearned and they're unstable, they rest. W-R-E-S-T. Now that word rest from the original Greek literally means to torture 
by rack. To torture by rack. If you've ever seen the old medieval times, uh, I want to say torture chamber, but how they punish people back in medieval times, way back when, they had this thing called a rack. And they would tie their arms above their head, and they would tie them at the ankle. And this thing had like a wheel on it, and they would stretch them. There it is. And they would stretch them, and they would stretch them. And they would stretch him. This is what Peter is saying that this world is doing to the truth and to the scripture. They're taking the word of God and they're stretching it. Who glory. They're stretching it so wide until the truth becomes dismembered. Until you can't recognize the truth from a lie. To you, can't, to you, you got you got people in political positions that don't have the gall to admit that there's a difference between a man and a woman. We've stretched the truth so much. We, we've, we've stretched it so much. We, we've racked it so much until the truth has become unrecognizable. And, and when you read the text at first, it might seem like they're talking about a person that they're doing this to. But let's read it again. Verse 16 says this. It says, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. They're taking the scriptures and they're stretching them, hallelujah, to fit their lifestyle. You see, when I came to God, I was told that I had to conform my life to God's word. And if I conform my life to God's word, he would change me and he would save me. But we live in a generation now that says, no, I don't have to change to God's word, but I can stretch God's word to include whatever I want to do. The devil is a liar. Hallelujah. If you're going to live for God, you've got to live by his word. You can't stretch it to fit your needs. You can't stretch it to make it be what you want it to be. Saints of God, the truth is on trial in this day and age. The truth is under attack. And what these unstable and ungodly folks are doing is stretching the truth. And they're going to stretch it until what happens? On that table that Eddie just posed pet up there, you keep winding that thing. An arm's going to pop off. A leg's going to pop off. The body is going to be dismembered. Hallelujah. Listen to me now. The body is going to be dismembered when we continually stretch the truth. Listen, the word of God, the body of Christ, it's held together by the truth of the gospel. If we stretch the truth, then you eliminate the body. The body has got to stick together, and the only way the body of Christ can stick together is if it's founded on the truth of God's word. And so what they want to do is they want to rack it. <laughs> I saw the story of William Wallace. <laughs> and and when, they, when, when they were going to put him to death they had him on one of these racks and the little guy in, tor in charge of the, the torture he said rack him mm -hmm. and that's what the enemy is saying right now every time you, 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 you run up against someone who's bringing you a little, little false truth and trying to convince you Every, every, every trying to convince you to go contrary to the word of God, you got Satan standing on their shoulder saying, rack them. But saints of God, it's imperative that you have your foundation sure, that you know where you stand, that you know, hallelujah, that you have a sure foundation with Jesus Christ. 
So it doesn't matter which way they pull it. Don't matter how tight the wheel get. Doesn't matter how much they stretch the truth. You're going to stand on the word of God. Huh? That's why it's imperative that you are filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because, see, no one can deny that. You see, once you've had that experience, no one can take that experience from you. It is the one thing in my life that I can always fall back on. If I ever get weak in faith, I can always remember that I was filled with God's spirit. I felt the spirit of God un uncontrolled by me, but by him. He came into my life. By invitation, that is. I invited him in. Oh, glory. And I was so glad when he came in, saints of God. I was so glad when he came in. And I'm going to tell you today that if you will open up, he'll come into your life too. Yeah. Hallelujah. I had been in, in, in church my whole, I had been going to church my whole life. I had been going to church my whole life. I had a firm belief that there was a God. But the day I got the Holy Ghost, Brother, he, Brother Peter, everything changed. Hallelujah. I said, wait a minute. There's something to this God thing. Glory. I felt the power of God coming in myself, in my spirit. I felt his presence come into my life. And things changed. I said to myself, oh, this is not a hoax, hallelujah. There's something to this Holy Ghost thing. I began to speak with other tongues, hallelujah. It let me know that God was real. Who glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. But over the course of time, hallelujah, time has allowed us to twist the word of God. It's the twisting of time. Things that, that, that we, I mean, things that are clearly, there are some things the Bible says that nature itself teaches you. Some things you don't need anybody to teach you. Nature itself teaches you. And people are saying, well, I got a question about that. Whoa, 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 come on. Come on. You know what they're doing? They've got the truth on a torture platter. And the devil is saying, rack him. God, glory. Who glory. But I'm glad. I'm glad, hallelujah, that when Jesus got out of the grave, he got up with all power in his hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is, he said, oh, glory. You know what he said? You know how he said it, brother? With it? He said, I am the way, hallelujah, the truth. Come on. Come on, and the life. So I don't care how much they try. What you, what you following, Brother McClary? I'm following the way, the truth, and the life. What is that? That's Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Hallelujah. Listen, if you can't get excited about that, something's wrong with you. I'm sorry. If you can't get excited about having God enter into your life and being filled, something's wrong with you. Either you hadn't experienced it the right way or, or something's wrong with you. <laughs> no offense. Because if you, get the, if, you, if you feel the Holy Ghost, you're talking about peace and joy. You talk about excitement. Woo, you talk about something like, like electricity going through your body. Man, it's something good. It's good. Oh, glory. It'll, it'll make you do things you never thought you'd. Look at me. Look at me. Look at, look, 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 look at me. Sometimes I said, I said, what do you do? How'd you get here? What, 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 what? The Holy Ghost. Oh, glory. It came on in there. It gave me a boldness. It made me want to tell everybody about Jesus. Oh, glory. But time. Don't get caught up in the twisting of the time. Because time that God has given us, him being gracious has given us time. Him being long-suffering as the scripture declares. Long-suffering toward us. Giving us time. But the enemy has got in there and convinced people. That the time, the grace period that God has been given us, that he's so wonderfully and graciously given us. 
The enemy has us. Well, look at you. He's just way. They've been talking about this stuff for years. Ain't nothing changed. The devil is a lie. Don't get caught up in the twisting of time. Amen. Uh, let's, let's stand together. Ooh, time's almost gone. Listen, I, I was a. Uh, I was sitting here. Uh, thinking to myself, and I was, God had given me this, this, this message, and I was thinking, gee whiz, what a title, you know, and I thought about the twisting of time, and, and my initial text was, my initial thought was, uh, don't get twisted, and I thought to myself that back when I was in the world, twisted mean getting uh, drunk, and I said, no, I don't want to say that. <laughs> I don't want you to get twisted. But I also don't want you to get caught up in the twisting of the world's time. Because over the period of time that God has given us to seek him and to take advantage of our salvation, the enemy has distorted it by ignorant, willfully ignorant folks unlearned folks and unstable folks the Bible says they are willfully ignorant they are unlearned and they are unstable and they rest the scripture they stretch it as far as they can how far whatever I want to do I'll stretch it till it meets my need I'll stretch the truth until it allows me to do whatever I want to do and call myself a child of God. But the devil is a lie. We have to stand on the truth of the word of God. Amen. I just want to encourage you tonight, saints of God, be holy. Be holy. Don't, don't, don't be influenced by this world. Don't be influenced by the ignorant, unlearned, and unstable folks in this world. You stay grounded to the word of God. Stay grounded to the truth. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you tonight, Lord God, for your people. I thank you for your word tonight, Lord God. I pray, God, that you keep us, that you strengthen us, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to walk in the truth of your word, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, be with us, Lord God. Lead us and guide us, Lord, in this dark and evil day, Lord God. We need your direction, Lord God. We need you to help us. We need you to keep us, Lord God. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.